Monday, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're watching me from around the world. Thank you for joining me for this week's teaching. I am Krista Bontrager, and I am a Christian theologian and public apologist. And this is the channel where I offer teaching about the Bible and theological commentary on social issues. It has been almost two months now since the Black Sabbath of October 7th in Israel. As I am recording this, some of the hostages are being exchanged for a temporary ceasefire and the release of Hamas criminals. So we will see how much longer the conflict goes on there, or at least this conflict for now. I doubt that this conflict will come to a true end. It will just stop for a little while and then we will recycle to it in the future. And because we know that this is a cyclical conflict, I feel like I would not be serving you well if I didn't do at least one teaching about the history of Israel, largely because this entire conflict is rooted and grounded in a very hard and complicated ethnic blood war between two groups of people and to not at least attempt to explain that history is to be remiss in my responsibilities to you as a teacher to help equip you to have better conversations with others. Now, in transparency, it has definitely been a long and winding road for me as I have been researching the history of this conflict in an effort to put the current situation into some kind of historical context. I will admit to you freely that I started this process with almost no knowledge about the history of Israel. Now I think I have at least a working knowledge of the historical origins of this ethnic blood war on both sides of the narrative both what's happened in history and a little bit about what's happening today. So this discussion will be the fruit of that research, but that's not to say that that research is over or that I don't have more to learn. I certainly do, and this will likely lead to continued conversations and reading and study on my part moving into the future. This will be part one of a short two-part series on the issue of history in Israel. And in this episode, I'm going to survey some of the key events in the early 20th century up through the establishment of the State of Israel in 1949. This will be a, a big picture overview of the roots of the current day problems. My hope is that it will not only provide you with some information and some data, but also with a framework and a working knowledge so that you can interpret much of the propaganda that is circulating out there in the media. And what I've noticed is that one side has a tendency to give a selection of certain facts and the other side gives a slice of other facts. And then both sides throw in a bunch of painful stories of multi-generational trauma to help support their perspective. And this has made it very challenging to find objective, fact-based information about these issues that paints the whole picture and, you know, includes primary sources and, and that sort of a thing. So I'm going to do my best to present this teaching. Uh, I've tried my best based on my best understanding of a fact-based uh, historical presentation of events. And I'm sure with that, that there are things I have missed. There are facts that I will not talk about that some people may think are crucial, vital, and um, narrative changing, but all I could do is my best and let you know that I am still in my own process. Another tricky part about making this content on Israel right now is that I am a complete cultural outsider. I am an American of European descent. I'm not Jewish. I'm not Arab. I'm a complete outsider to the discussion. And in the beginning, I was very ignorant. I had a lot of education and research to do. In reflection, I am wondering if my standpoint as a cultural outsider could in some way possibly maybe be an advantage. 
I don't have all of the multi-generational baggage attached to this discussion that some may have. And I'm simply wanting to understand what's happening in an objective way and then think about it through the lens of the Christian worldview. Now, after watching at least 20 documentaries and doing a lot of reading on the internet about the history of Israel from both sides of the discussion, I'm going to play for you the discussion that I felt seems to be the fairest to both sides. It sticks with pretty much just the events and describing the events. Now, I'm not saying that this is the perfect description, but I do think that this Jewish history professor that you're going to hear in just a moment, his effort is the best that I've come across so far. So what I'm going to play is a video by Dr. Henry Abramson. It's entitled Origins of the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict, Part 1 to 1949. And then I'm going to stop it occasionally and make some additional comments to fill in some extra details that Dr. Abramson doesn't cover. Now, I don't know Dr. Abramson. This isn't a paid endorsement of him or his work, but here is a little about his education and background from his website. It says he's a specialist in Jewish history and thought. He serves at, as the dean of Turo University in Brooklyn, New York. He earned his PhD in history from the University of Toronto with a dissertation on the Jews of the Ukraine that was published by Harvard in 1999. He's done postdocs and visiting professorships at Cornell, Harvard, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So you can see all of his credentials and everything there at his website, henryabramson.com. Just click on his About page. Based on that information, I would say that Dr. Abramson seems to be a legitimate scholar. He has a wide academic background. He seems to be a religious Jew, not a secular Jew. So I'm taking all of this at face value. As far as I can tell, he doesn't seem to be a crazy person or an extremist. And so with that, we will watch Dr. Abramson's video. And again, I will be stopping to comment on it occasionally and offering a few additional points. Hello, fellow students of Jewish history. My goal in this short video is to quickly cover the roots of the current unfortunate conflict with emphasis on the period from the middle of the 19th century to the armistice of 1949. There's a lot of material on this crucial period that occupies much of the world's attention right now and really for the last century. Uh, much of the material online is unfortunately highly tendentious and very misleading. I'm going to be relying very heavily on the research of Professor Gudrun Kramer from the Free University of Berlin, who wrote a very serviceable one-volume history. She has made a very good case for the fact that most historians come to this topic with a great degree of tunnel vision and tend to see the entire history from within the perspective of their own national, religious, ethnic backgrounds. And I'm going to do my best to try and rise above that. Obviously, I have my own biases and my own opinions like everybody else, but let's try and go over the facts in as dispassionate a manner as possible, and um, then I can leave it up to you to debate what it means for our current moment. Yeah, quick comment here. I do appreciate that. He says up front that, that people tend to come to this history through their ethnic, national, and religious perspectives, and I have found that to be true. I have found that even voices that I normally trust and love and appreciate in their perspectives, they are not able to talk about the history of Israel in an objective and dispassionate way. They do see it through a particular lens, and that just seems to be almost universally true. So I appreciate him acknowledging that challenge up front that comports with my experience as well, and I appreciate his effort here. So let's start with the discussion of terminology, because as Professor Kramer rightly points out, there is power in naming things. And so my intention here is just to achieve clarity, even though some anachronisms may result. And I apologize for those of you who are deeply steeped in this history. This will be somewhat basic. But let's just make sure we're all on the same page with this. First of all, 
the term Palestinian. So Palestine is the name that was given to this region of the world. In the next section, I'm going to take you through some maps to say, well, which region exactly. Um, it is a term that derives originally from a Roman adaptation in the second century, after having dealt with three revolts of the Jewish population, they decided to completely wipe out the name Judea, which was the Jewish name of the uh, southern part of what would be the land of Israel today, and they renamed the entire section Palestina. So that term entered into Western usage already from the second century and was later adapted, for example, in the Arab world as Philistine. Let me make a quick comment about uh, Palestine uh, before he gets into Palestinian. So, you know, just even doing a search on Bible Gateway for the term Palestine, there's no place called Palestine in the Bible. That land is called Israel. It's called Judah. Early on, it's called Canaan, the land of Canaan. But there is no Palestine in the biblical times. Most of the stories, especially from the Jewish perspective, say that the term Palestine originated just as Dr. Abramson recounted here is from the time of the Roman Empire. One of the Roman emperors got sick of all of the revolts in the land of Israel and all of the Jews who were trying to revolt and disrupt the Roman government. And so in an effort to marginalize them and separate them from their land and begin to to, to shame them ethnically, he renamed Israel Palestine. And that's happening at about 135 AD. There is some effort to say that it's a little bit more ancient than that on the Palestinian side, but most people say it started at 135. I just haven't had a chance to trace down all of those receipts to see which is more ancient, but it's still within a 200-year window. Let's continue be the land of Israel today, and they renamed the entire section Palestina. So that term entered into Western usage already from the second century and was later adapted, for example, in the Arab world as Philistine. Um, now, Palestinian was also used in the 20th century and in the 19th century as well to refer to Jews who lived in this region as well, who would call themselves Palestinian Jews. I know that sounds strange today, but for example, look at this newspaper, the Palestine Post, which is actually a Jewish newspaper. Its name was later changed to the Jerusalem Post, but that's just because the term did not have the strong ethnic and national connotations that it has today. So that's Palestinian. Okay, let me say a quick word about this too, because this is also very confusing. So you have to kind of set aside your understanding of the word Palestinian and how it is used today. And we're going to talk for a minute about what I'm going to call like the classical usage of the word Palestinian. Palestine was always just a region or a territory within another kingdom. So in the beginning, that was the Roman Empire, and then it was the, uh, I believe, the Byzantine Empire, and then it was taken over by the Muslims. There was a short period when it was taken over by the Crusaders. And then it was recaptured by the Muslims, I believe. And then it went to the, the Ottoman Empire. And then when at the end of World War I, when the Ottoman Empire found themselves on the wrong side of history, then it was taken over by the British. But in all of those scenarios, Palestine was just a region or a territory that was being ruled by a larger kingdom. Palestine was never a kingdom itself. It was never a country. It was never, it, it never had a king. It never had a currency. What's confusing then for us today is that it's come to mean a certain ethnic group, but that has not historically been the case. You have to, again, kind of decouple that idea of the modern usage of the word Palestinian with the way that the term was used up until about the 1950s, early 1960s. It was just to refer to someone who lived in the territory of Palestine. You could be a, a Palestinian Jew. You could be a Palestinian Christian. 
You could be a Palestinian Arab, and that is how they were referred to, is you're a Palestinian Jew, Palestinian Christian, or Palestinian Arab. There was no ethnicity called Palestinian. Up until the 1960s, there was just people who lived in Palestine, this region of Palestine, were Palestinian no matter what religious connection they had. Okay, let's keep going. Israeli. Israeli refers to people who have citizenship in the state of Israel. And approximately 20% of the people who have citizenship in the state of Israel would call themselves Palestinian. This is just an indication of how confusing it is. Israeli citizenship is extended to a, a large number of Arabs, Druze, Christians, Baha'i, and other peoples uh, who are not Jewish. So Israeli refers to a citizenship in the state of Israel. What about the term Arab? So Arab is an ethnic term that refers to a large number of people all across the entire Middle East. It includes Palestinians, but it does not include Muslims. Muslim is an even larger term. It is a religious term referring to people who worship according to the dictates of Islam. And that includes all kinds of people in the Far East, for example, or in Africa, and of course in the United States and on. Uh, the term Jew is also, it's a religious term, but it's also an ethnic term because many people who are Jews do not consider themselves religious, but nevertheless, they still fall within this ethnic definition. And as I mentioned, about 80% of Israelis are also Jewish. Think of like the big circle is ethnic Jews. And then there's like a subset or a circle inside that of religious Jews. So this is why Jew to be a Jew is first an ethnicity. And under that ethnicity includes culture. Okay. Culture is part of that. And that culture is global. You can find Jews all around the world who participate in different cultural practices as a Jew. But then there is this subsection of Jews who are religious and then more subsets inside that circle of the way or the stream of Judaism that they find themselves in. Uh, but about half of the world's Jews are not Israelis. Israel houses about half of the entire population of the world's Jews, in other words. Finally, Zionist. So Zionist, the term Zionism was coined in the late 19th century to describe this movement towards reestablishing a Jewish homeland in the land which we're going to call Palestine. This uh, is an aspiration that does not necessarily mean it has to come to fruition in actual Israeli statehood. It can also be understood as support for the land of Israel. And once again, uh, the majority of Jews clearly are Zionist and support the state of Israel to one degree or another, but there are many Jews who are not Zionists. There are even some Israelis who are not Zionist, believe it or not. That's because Israel is a democratic country that tolerates a very wide range of difference of opinion on a whole host of political, social, economic, and other issues. So that's our basic survey of terminology. This definition of Zionism is very consistent with the one that my friend Callie Mitchell gave in my interview with her is Zionism, you know, means one thing, but then there's a lot of different streams of Zionism underneath that. So he's just sort of touching on that. You know, there's political Zionism and cultural Zionism, religious Zionism and all of that. All right, let's continue. Where exactly is Palestine? The borders of the region, which has been called Palestine, varies significantly over the space of the last two millennia. There has never been a state of Palestine, that is true, but the region has had that term already, as we see, from the second century. Uh, it is especially well used after the seventh century when it becomes an Islamic land, and in the region of the Ottoman Empire, which ruled for almost exactly 500 years until the beginning of the 20th century, it was actually divided uh, between two administrative sections, that of Jerusalem and that of Beirut. So the regional identity of Palestine, or in Arabic, Philistine, was not very well developed really until the 20th century. 
Uh, it nevertheless did have consciousness. You see from this newspaper, Philistin, which was actually established in 1909, very early on in this period. But for many, the term Palestine geographically is identical to the boundaries of the state of Israel, which in itself is a huge problem. Uh, as you see in this depiction here, Philistin, which has the uh, the slogan, Min il nahar il il bahar, from the river to the sea, the river being the Jordan River on the west and the Mediterranean Sea on the east. Uh, by saying Min il nahar il il bahar, you're saying essentially, at least this is how Jews hear it, that there's no space for Israel. There's only space for Palestine. Uh, in other words, Palestine will be free, meaning free of Jews, Judenrein, which is why many Jews find this deeply offensive. When Jews hear the phrase, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, what they hear with that is genocide, the land of Palestine being free from Jews. Well, how are we going to get rid of all the Jews? Well, by whatever means necessary. We're going to force them out. We're going to kill them, whatever it is, free of Jews. Now, it's a, it has become the freedom statement for people that identify ethnically now as Palestinian, which is a very particular ethnic group, from what I can tell, started by Yasser Arafat in the 1960s, where he started using the term Palestinian as a way of creating kind of an ethnic identity marker of those people that from from their perspective were indigenous to the land of Palestine, non-Jews. We used to call them Arabs, okay? Arabs are very ancient. In fact, Arabs are mentioned on Pentecost back in Acts chapter two. So in other words, the boundaries of Palestine as understood by many Palestinian supporters today are virtually identical to the boundaries of modern Israel shown here. Um, in the next video in this plan series, I'll explain what are the differences between uh, Israel proper, Gaza, the West Bank, and the Golan Heights. But for now, this is basically the territory that we're going to be speaking about over the course of this video. At the risk of horrible oversimplification, Jewish claims at their root are based on the idea that this is the ancient homeland of the Jews. And Palestinian claims are based on the notion that they conquered the land in the 7th century with the advent of Islam, and that makes them essentially indigenous because they have been living in that region for some 1,300 years. This is a little bit like something I saw with two of my grandchildren the other day. I don't mean to reduce these complex and painful issues to something very juvenile, but this will at least help as a metaphor. Two of my grandchildren have a favorite chair, which was given to them by the other set of grandparents, and it actually has the name of the older child written on it. So the younger child was sitting on it, and the older child wanted to take it from the younger child, and we said, no, you, you have to let her sit there. But then she saw something that distracted her. She got up from the chair, and she went off to do something else. And in that time, the older child went and sat in the chair, which upset the younger child seeing that she was in there. And that involved a whole bunch of fighting. Uh, but basically, that's the same kind of claim. I was here first versus you left and then I took it. And the fact that the name is written on the chair does not necessarily feed into whose chair it is forever and ever because, to extend this back to our situation, the main source of the claim, the deed, as it were, for the land of Israel for Jews is the Bible. And Muslims do not regard the Bible, the, the Hebrew scriptures, and for that matter, the Christian scriptures, as being duly sanctified the same way that Jews and Christians do. So the deed is not relevant here. It's true that uh, there's multiple points to demonstrate that Jews were in the land of Israel from ancient times. Uh, the oldest non-biblical example is the famous Merneptah stele shown here, which dates from about the year 1209 BCE and refers to a people called Israel living here. But 
the counter argument that when the Muslims conquered in the seventh century, as you see in this map, is also a very strong one. And in the absence of divine intervention, which I'm sure both sides would like to appeal to, there's no easy way to reconcile these claims. Okay, that's a super helpful summary of a really big underlying issue that is not always brought out in the forefront of the conversation, but it's lurky there in the background. And so I'm super glad that he brings this out. And that is the question of who is indigenous to the land of Israel or Palestine, depending on which side of the conversation you're on. So if you're a Jew, you're going to probably call it Israel. If you're quote, part of the Palestinian side, and I'm using the modern sense of the Palestinian terminology, the Yasser Arafat version of it, and to refer to Arabs or non-Jews. So who is more indigenous to the land? Is it the Jews or is it the Palestinians? Is it And connecting that to the Muslims. All right. Well, this is a hotly disputed claim. And I think that I appreciate his chair analogy with his grandchildren, because we've all witnessed this with our own children or our grandchildren of you know, hey, I was here first and no, you have to share. And then they get up and they leave and the other child jumps in. No, you know, um, possession is nine tenths of the law. And who is more indigenous? Now, from what I understand, and I find this very hard to believe, but I think, and someone could write in and correct me, so I won't make this mistake again if I'm wrong, but I think that in Islam, there's a strain of thought that says there is no evidence for things like Solomon's temple. My understanding, and I find this so hard to believe, but I watched a, a whole video of man on the street videos where they were asking people who lived in Gaza and the West Bank about, well, how do you make of the evidence for in archaeology for the Jews living in the land prior to the Muslims? And all of these people in the man on the street interviews said, no, there is no evidence or that's fake. And I'm thinking, I don't understand this because there is so much evidence, but okay. So there is this, this claim apparently that it has to be sorted out. And the two sides have very different ideas about the claim. So let's just set aside the biblical claim of, you know, God giving the land to Abraham and his descendants, and it's an unbreakable promise. Let's just set that aside for a moment and just talk about who was there first. Well, who was there first was the Jews, the children of Israel. Historically speaking, it seems that they would have more of a claim to the land. So then what I've seen Arabs try to do, and it's hijacked by the Palestinians the modern use of the term Palestinian, Muslims and um, that that group is, no, we are actually indigenous to the land. We go back even further than Islam. We're related to the Canaanites. And so there are some efforts that I see by Muslim apologists to say that these Palestinians who live in, in the land of Israel now are actually connected originally to the Canaanites. Now, I find that claim to be very peculiar. I don't think it's well supported, but that does seem to be the claim. But all of that to say this question of who is more indigenous to the land has a deep root in the, this blood feud between the, the Jews and the Palestinians. Hey everyone, quick time out here, then we'll get right back to the program, but I wanted to take a minute to tell you about something really cool. It's called the Commuter Bible. Now, I know that many of you are gearing up to start your read through the Bible plan. Maybe you've done it in years past and you just want to have a refresher. The Commuter Bible is a wonderful way for you to listen to the entire Bible in a year, but it's delivered to you as short podcasts that you can listen to them as you commute. They're delivered to you Monday through Friday. It's pretty cool. They have three plans for you to choose from. There's a read through the New Testament plan, read through the Old Testament, or read through the entire Bible. So if you're reading through the New Testament, 
you got to have a short commute, you know, maybe 15 minutes. You want to read through the entire Bible, a little bit longer commute. Maybe it's a 25 minute commute. Either way, all the plans are totally free. You can go check out their website, commuterbible.org. It's so cool. It's the whole Bible in a year as a podcast. It even has little introductory notes to set the context and music to help break up the monotony of the the speaking. It is free on your favorite podcast app. Go check it out, commuterbible.org. So let's move to the Ottoman period and specifically to the area we'd like to concentrate, the 19th century, to understand how this conflict expressed itself. The metaphor of my grandchildren in the chair is not entirely accurate for a lot of reasons, one of which is that there was always a small presence of Jews in the land of Israel, as best we can tell from historical records. Having a look at uh, the very weak statistics from the Ottoman Empire wasn't until the latter part of the 19th century that they started to provide more, you know, reliable statistics, but this gives us at least some sense of it. In 1850, looking at Ottoman subjects only, not foreign people living in this land, um, Muslims and Druze who were included in this survey amounted to about 88% of the population, Christians about 8%. Let me just make a quick well, uh, clarification there. He keeps he's second time he's used this word Druze. It's not Jews. It's Druze. This is another ethnic group that are similar to Muslims, but they seem to be their own group. But that rhymes with Jews, and the caption is wrong. So I just want to let you know if you want to try to Google that term and find out what the Druze, who they are, and what they believe, you'll be searching for the right thing. And Jews about four percent. But by the time you move to the later part of the 19th century, there is a significant shift in Jewish attitudes and many Jews, you know, really absorbing the national movements that are rocking much of Europe at the time, Eastern Europe in particular, they begin to explore the idea of developing a Jewish nationalism with the object of creating a Jewish national state in this part of the world as well. The most famous early movement is called Bilu taken from this verse in the Bible, Beit Yaakov, L'Chub Nelcha, House of Jacob, let us arise and go, meaning go to the land of Israel and colonize it there in order to establish a Jewish settlement back in the ancient homeland. And in fact, they did uh, work in the land with some success, uh, but they were heavily supported by Jews around the world. The idea of Zionism, especially promoted by Theodor Herzl, really caught the imagination of Jews living around the world saying, yes, of course, this is a fantastic idea. And although most Jews were not specifically willing to pick themselves up and move to Israel, they were overwhelmingly very happy to support the movement, especially financially. You can see in this poster here, these are some English language posters, help him build Palestine. Once again, it's clearly a Jewish poster at the bottom. It's written in Yiddish, help him build the land of Israel. This was the kind of fundraising poster that was used by the Jewish National Fund established specifically to buy lands in Palestine, which they bought legally throughout this entire period. Here's another one that gives you a sense of the kind of modern feeling of it a nation reborn on its ancestral soil. It really appeals to the imagination. It's young, it's powerful, has kind of like a socialist vibe to it. And in fact, the, the early settlements did have very strong socialist leanings and so on. Let me make a quick comment about that just sort of side comment that he makes there about socialists. Early in Israel's history, there was a good number of the people who, who came to settle in Israel that were fairly what we would call now left-leaning and socialist. In fact, the, the kibbutz movement, which you can look up on YouTube, is what is a kibbutz? It's it's a it's a group of people who want to live together in kind of a socialist um, commune, kind of shared economy and 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 shared resources way of living. And the kibbutz movement is is still going. It's it's still out there. And socialism can work in some cases on a very, very small scale, usually for one generation. 
what we don't see evidence for is like the large, massive, countrywide version of socialism. That's a different question. But Israel, this is, the socialism is part of Israel's history to some degree. And so I just wanted to expand his comment there and put that in a little more context. Okay, let's continue. Vibe to it. And in fact, the, the early settlements did have very strong socialist leanings and so on. So basically, as you move through the early 20th century, the population of Jews in the region increases dramatically. Looking at this chart of statistics, which was taken by the British much more uh, accurate and reasonable than the Ottoman figures, you can see that in 1922, the blue column are Jews. Of course, the green column are the, the Muslims. There's also Christians. And then here we've broken out the Druze, the Baha'i, and many other peoples living in the land. Uh, by 1931, there has been a natural increase of Muslims, both through birth rate, but also through immigration. And the Jewish increase has also been marked. By 1946, is even more dramatic. And in fact, this is one of the arguments that needs to be teased out is um, how many of the Arabs who moved to this region uh, were in fact from other parts of the Arabic world and later adopted a Palestinian identity. It's something that the his historical literature uh, discusses at some length. The issue of immigration plays a huge role in the current conflict because there are hard feelings on what is called now the Palestinian side that they see all of these migrants that came at the end of the 19th century through today who were Jewish, who came from Europe, and many of those people were white. So that also is an underlying current in this conversation. And also some people from Jews from the Middle East who fled under Islam and came to Israel. So there is this, this idea of immigration that plays a role in the discussion. Now, on the Palestinian side, they are quite resentful about this Jewish immigration that they see as being illegal immigrants. People who came to the land started buying land. Sometimes there's accusations of stolen land from the Palestinian side. And I said, you don't belong here. You have no physical claim to the land. We are the indigenous people. We are we were here first. OK, whereas Jews, when they were coming, they said, no, our ancestors were here first. Some Jews have remained in the land since those times. It's a small minority. But the as more and more Jews came into the land, settled the land and started living next door and side by side with the Arabs, this kind of ethnic rivalry between these two and the question of who owns the land, who is indigenous and the issue of immigration, all of these things are part of the discussion. And there are accusations on the Arab or Palestinian side of land being stolen um, of an illegal immigration, whereas the Jews are saying, no, we have a right to this land. Now, on the Israeli side, they would say also, well, these people who are running around now calling themselves Palestinians, they're Arabs, but they aren't native to the land either. Many of them, the claim is, were workers, migrant workers, who came from places like Syria and Jordan and Lebanon, and they came into Israel or Palestine as farm workers. They're not, they're not any more indigenous to this land than we are. We're all immigrants is kind of the claim. So what Dr. Abramson is, is very quickly alluding to here is this whole controversy about migrants, immigrants, who's really native, and all of that. And because there are quite a, a lot of discussions about what percentage of the Arabs or the Palestinians were not just 100 years ago living in some other country and migrated to Palestine for work or as farm workers. 
Now, basically, what happens is the Ottoman Empire absorbs these Jewish immigrants with a certain amount of tension. Uh, they are buying the land legally from Arab notables living in the region. There's a certain amount of competition with the local Arab workforce and a certain amount of hesitancy to admit people who are definitely trying to build a new nation state in this region. There's also a kulturkampf, a culture struggle between the highly uh, conservative Muslims living in the region and these European modern Jewish immigrants who are, you know, having women dressed differently, educated very differently, uh, engage in different kinds of cultural activities, which many of the Muslims find shocking and different and so on, is in the context of World War I, the Ottoman Empire disappears, and the British and the French engage in very large geopolitical discussions to essentially divide up the region between them. The way this plays out specifically for the region we're talking about is especially represented in this document here. Uh, written by the Foreign Secretary Lord Balfour. This is the so-called Balfour Declaration, in which he writes this message to Lord Rothschild uh, and asks him to send it to the Zionist Federation. And look at the inside paragraph there, which really encapsulates the problem that the British would have for the next 50-odd years. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. That's at the point where most Jews just stopped reading, and it was a big party for them because it looked like England, which was in fact very soon going to take over this region with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, England was going to give Palestine to the Jews. But the second part of the paragraph reads, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Meaning the British were saying essentially two things at the same time. On the other hand, they're going to give some of this land to the Jews for their Jewish homeland. Uh, but at the same time, they're saying as long as the Arab peoples living there do not object. And that's basically going to be impossible. Uh, it's also uh, going to be something which will will definitely affect the Jews living in any other country as well, as we shall see. Jews celebrate this with great excitement, and Arabs are concerned. Uh, they're not using the term Palestinians for themselves, but as I mentioned in the prelude, let's just refer to them as Palestinians. That term will become much more popular when we get to the second half of the 20th century. The first uh, series of disturbances were associated with the Nabi Musa festival, which ironically commemorates the life of Moses, uh, held sacred by both Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And in the context of this initial riot, five Jews and four Arabs were killed, and 230 people, primarily Jews in this case, were injured. And this kicks off a series of riots and retaliations, Arab riots against Jews and occasionally Jewish riots against Arabs as well, uh, that go throughout the 1930s, culminating in a major period between 1936 and 1939 of very, very heavy violence. Now, the Balfour Declaration is a whole thing in and of itself. He's just only very briefly mentioning it, but this is often cited by Jews as being the foundation for really Israel moving toward being a, a nation. And this document is referenced over and over and over. So you, you'll likely hear this and or come across it. Now, what happens then, and he, he's he's summarizing it very nicely here because this is messy. This here is the messy part. After the Balfour de Declaration, there are a series of riots, and these riots are on both sides. There's killing on both sides. There's theft and torture and just breaking a lot of commandments on both sides of this issue. And this is really where the ethnic blood feud starts to ramp up. And if you go on 
discussions, particularly on the Palestinian side of the conversation, the picture is often painted, hey, we were living here peacefully all together. And, you know, there were some Jews, some Arabs, some Christians. It was all in peaceful harmony. And then England gets involved. The white Westerners get involved in this this situation where all the cousins are living peacefully with one another. And then this blood feud breaks out. And it is just a lot of, of bad behavior on both sides. And both sides will have a tendency to try to paint it as they were the victim. And they were the victim. And so was the other side a victim. Like there's just a bunch of sinful people running around doing horrible things to each other. So they, they have engaged in this form of tribalism and they're going to fight to the death to see who's going to control this land. I will allow other historians to work out, you know, which acts of violence were more significant, but there's no question that the what people refer to as the cycle of violence really begins in 1920, right after the Balfour Declaration. So the British right away, they're very good at establishing commissions, and they establish a new commission under Earl Peel, uh, and he issues a massive document called the Peel Report. And very rarely has anyone said it as well as this particular report does. I'll just read to you one section. This is from chapter 20, which could basically say the same thing about much of the later part of the century as well. The problem of Palestine is briefly restated. Under the stress of the World War, this is, of course, World War I, the British government made promises to Arabs and Jews in order to obtain their support. On the strength of those promises, both parties formed certain expectations. This is a big issue, is that during World War I, Israel or Palestine at that time was under the control of the Ottoman Empire. The British came in and recruited Arab leaders to help them overthrow the Ottoman Empire. Now, why did they do that? Because they made promises to them that then Palestine would be able to be a free nation. It would it would be part of the the effort and the rise of nationalism after World War One. So just as Jordan became a country, Syria became a country, Lebanon became a country, I think even like Iraq and Iran became countries, that Palestine would become its own country. And so the British went in there, they they enticed, recruited, however you want to characterize that, uh, a, a lot of Arab leaders and some Jewish leaders, hey, come join our effort to overthrow the Ottoman Empire, and then we will give you this land and you will be a free country after World War I. And it was a bunch of broken promises. That led to more problems and resentment about the British. The British said, no. You know, we kind of think that you're not quite ready yet to uh, run your own nation. We're going to stay in here a little while after the war. We're going to come in. We're going to control things. And, you know, when you're truly ready, then we will allow you to have the country. And so the Peel Commission is part of this effort to sort of sort out among the British what exactly to do after World War I with the land of Palestine or Israel. The application to Palestine of the mandate system in general and of the specific mandate in particular implies the belief that the obligations thus undertaken towards the Arabs and the Jews respectively would prove in course of time to be mutually compatible owing to the conciliatory effect on the Palestinian Arabs of the material prosperity which Jewish immigration would bring in Palestine as a whole. That belief has not been justified, and there seems to be no hope of its being justified in the future. In other words, the British said that they were hoping that, you know, by having Jews move in and improve the economy, and the Peel Report actually discusses that, yeah, Jewish immigration did help the economy significantly. There was a lot more employment. There was a lot more capital flowing and a lot more foreign investment, but that prosperity would not help to solve the political dispute between the Arabs and the Jews in this region. 
Let's go back. But the British people cannot, on that account, repudiate their obligations, and apart from obligations, the existing circumstances in Palestine would still require the most strenuous efforts on the part of the government, which is responsible for the welfare of the country. The existing circumstances are summarized as follows. An irrepressible conflict has arisen between two national communities within the narrow bounds of one small country. There is no common ground between them. Their national aspirations are incompatible. The Arabs desire to revive the traditions of the Arab Golden Age. The Jews desire to show what they can achieve when restored to the land in which the Jewish nation was born. Neither of the two national ideals permits of combination in the service of a single state. This may be the genesis of what was called the two-state solution, which was eagerly pursued by many diplomatic efforts in the second half of the 20th century. God willing, we'll get to that in another lecture. Uh, the Peel Report had an appendix which laid out a map, a very controversial map here, that said we should partition this region. And the area outlined in red was to be given to the Jews as a homeland. As you can see, it's a tiny fraction of the later boundaries of the land of Israel and uh, not entirely conforming to the way the populations had spread out through the land. A lot of Arabs were in this region. A lot of Jews were outside this region. And Jews were incensed that this is what Peel was suggesting. And there's also that kind of like, uh, it looks like a word bubble extending from the ocean to Jerusalem. That's supposed to be like an international zone allowing for access to the holy sites in Jerusalem for everybody. And uh, the rest of the region outside of that red line would be an Arab country, presumably attached to what was called Transjordan. Transjordan was actually separated from the British mandate applied to Palestine earlier. So the Jews were incensed, the Arabs were not satisfied, and this came to naught. The period of 1936 to 1939 saw extensive dissatisfaction with the British mandate and the mandate authorities. Uh, Arab uprisings, Jewish violence against each other and against the British were pursued throughout this period. The British attempted under Colonial Secretary Malcolm MacDonald to look at the problem again, once the British, again, are very good at establishing commissions, and he wrote up a white paper that suggested perhaps they should limit Jewish immigration to the land to 75,000 people over five years, which was guaranteed to blow the lid off Jewish aspirations, because look at the time we're talking about. It's the late 1930s. Anti-Semitism is ramping up in Europe under Hitler. And of course, World War II would begin in 1939, just a few months after the white paper came out. And immigration of Jews anywhere was a top concern for the entire Jewish people because, of course, Hitler would take six million lives over the course of World War II. And again, he's, he's just glossing over some very complicated and bloody and uh, sad times in Israel on both sides of both sides attacking each other. Britain's broken promises after the World War One, And now we go into World War Two. We go through the Holocaust. Six million Jews have died. Now there's going to be a growing sympathy toward nationalism for Israel to give Jews their own land. This is really the root of so much of the resentment of the Palestinian people. This is the historical root of it all. After the Holocaust, you have millions of displaced people all over Europe. Hundreds of thousands of Jews in particular are unwilling or unable to return to their homes in Poland, and they're seeking to establish themselves in the ancestral homeland of Israel. Legal migration and illegal migration is happening at a tremendous clip, and the British are desperate to try and hold off these thousands of Jews who are seeking to make their way to safety in the Middle East. The Arabs, of course, are very incensed with the idea that Europe's problems should be solved with migration to the Middle East, but as one Zionist from the Arab put it, the Arabs have a problem of appetite and the Jews have a problem of starvation. They needed someplace else to live and no other place was acceptable. 
So basically, the British gave up. Very similar to how they dealt with their departure from India. You know, the entire geopolitical world had changed. Their, they had to retrench themselves after World War II, and they handed the problem off to the United Nations. The United Nations came up with this resolution, number 181, which essentially said the land should be partitioned into seven sections. And here's a map. Uh, which was attached to the bottom of Resolution 181, that divides the land of Israel quite differently from the Peel Report. The green areas were to be Jewish. There are three of them connected by tiny little wastes. And the goldenrod areas are to be Arab, also connected by these little wastes. And a seventh section was to be uh, around the area of Jerusalem, and that was supposed to be, like the Peel Report, some kind of international zone. The history after this point is well known. The Jews, now Israelis, accepted the plan, and in 1948 they proclaimed statehood, and they were immediately attacked by Arab armies surrounding them. They fought a very, very difficult war, but ended up managing to not only keep this territory, but in fact expand it somewhat. That's a very important part of this whole history, but we should understand that the conflict with the Palestinians really began even before that war happened, as soon as Resolution 181 was passed and before the British could leave, there was already violence erupting between Jews and Arabs. After the UN declares that Israel is a nation, there's this effort by what comes to be called the pan-Arab countries, so this is a lot of Arab countries that surround Israel, made an effort to go to war against Israel. So imagine that Israel, you know, is, as, a, as a state, I think it happened within like a day or a week. I mean, it just was nearly overnight. And they start attacking Israel, bombing Israel and all of that. And Israel is barely a nation and they're trying to fight back. And this is kind of one of the quote unquote miracles of Israel. All right. From the Israeli side, they would say, you know, God was with them. They were just this tiny nation. All of these Arab nations came against them, started bombing them, and they were able to fight back. And in their minds, in the Israeli minds, it wasn't just that the UN had made them a country to sort of waved a magic wand and said, okay, we're giving all this land to Israel, they would say, look, we fought a war. We conquered this land. It belongs to us now. This is our chair. You know, you may have been here for a while, but you left. We took over. We fought a war. And we conquered this land fair and square. That is the position on the Israeli side. So so they're not saying, you know, the UN just signed some papers and magically made Israel a state. That, that did sort of happen. But then within days, there was a war. And that went, war went on for a couple of years. And so from Israel's perspective, they won the land fair and square. Now, here's the complication. On the Palestinian side, this is referred to as the Nakba era. And this is the ground of so much hard feelings, okay? This is what you really must know, okay? Nakba, I believe, is Arabic for catastrophe. And so you will hear Palestinians talk about the Nakba, and this is what they mean. And it happened during this war period when Israel is trying to fight for its life against the pan- Arab countries coming against it. But again, as he says, this is not the root of everything. There were already problems going back to the 20s and 30s, but this is kind of the big event, the big catastrophe that Palestinians usually cite. A conflict with the Palestinians really began even before that war happened, as soon as Resolution 181 was passed and before the British could leave, there was already violence erupting between Jews and Arabs. And a large number of Arabs living in Palestine chose to flee. 
somewhere in the range of 700,000 Arabs left their homes seeking safety. Now, one of the larger debates, like we mentioned earlier with the cycle of violence, one of the larger debates focuses on the question of why exactly did they leave? It does not take a tremendous amount of imagination to realize that, you know, families flee theaters of war. There were examples of atrocities, and even an atrocity that is exaggerated and spread through the rumor mill is something that will strike fear in the heart of, of a family and would cause them to flee. Once again, I defer to other historians to go through the details. I'm sure you will find it useful to look at Professor Kramer's work to go into more details as to what specific events, Der Yassin and others, that prompted many of these people to flee. And on the Palestinian side, they would tell you that they were forced to flee from their homes during the war. Then the Israeli side, they'll tell you, yeah, they had to flee, but it was because these are the people who were also wanting to make war against us. All right. Either which way, about 700,000 people left to their homes and, and Arabs, they left their homes. Now, if you can go on YouTube, you can listen to a lot of sad stories of people who lived through this as children. And they will tell you their sad stories of how they were forced to leave their home. Now, the question that's raised is, were they forced at gunpoint or were they fleeing war? There's debates about that. Some of the Arabs would say, no, we were forced to leave. They rounded us up. Some people died. There's a horrible story of one particular village. The Israeli soldiers came in and just slaughtered the people. And that is a frequent story that's put forward. But many people will say, you know, we left and um, we thought maybe we were coming back eventually, but then they got rounded up and put in these refugee camps. These refugee camps, some of them were in Israel, some of them were in the West Bank area, some were in Jordan and Syria and other places and and have been scattered. And, and there are reports of people who who still live in these refugee camps three generations later, two and three generations later, who got pushed out from their land, from their family homes back during this, this period of the Nekwa. Okay, so this is part of the narrative of trauma for people on the Arab side, on the Palestinian side. And this is a big part of the root of the bad blood between the two sides, the part of the ethnic blood war between Arabs and Jews was this period. And there is a sense in which the descendants of these people continue to want their grievances to be heard. They rehearse these grievances in the media. This is the root of why they are so angry. And this is why one of the big reasons why they want justice. It is this historical event of their parents and grandparents being pushed out of their land. Now, again, on the Jewish side, they're going to say we had good warrant for it, or the numbers are greatly inflated. Or some people will tell you it didn't even really happen, okay? But to me, these stories seem compelling, even if they're on the smaller scale. This is an issue that I think that the Israeli side of the conversation, their explanations do not seem robust enough. In my, From my perspective as a cultural outsider, they do not seem robust enough to be able to explain the displacement of 700,000 people. That's an opinion. That's where I'm at now. I'm open to other ideas. Okay, let's finish this off. But this was called the Nakba, the catastrophe, which essentially displaced something like three quarters of a million people from what would become the state of Israel in the armistice of 1949. If you look at this map here, you can see the, the green areas were assigned to the state of Israel in the 1947 partition plan. But after successfully defending the territory, 
uh, the Israelis were able to actually add those pink areas to make the boundaries somewhat more defensible than they were before. That's essentially the origins of the Palestinian Nakba. It's also important to note that there is a Jewish version of this Nakba at the same time. Shortly after this war, there was a wave of anti-Jewish persecution throughout the Islamic world, particularly in Arab lands, and Jews were forced to flee from many of these countries. Perhaps 800,000 Jews were required to flee, many of them making their way to Israel, which ironically achieved the opposite purpose of what many of these states might have had in mind because it made Israel much more stable and stronger demographically and further cemented its presence in the Middle East. Okay, that's the end of part one of this discussion on the history of Israel. I hope you found this discussion helpful. We're going to put a bookmark right there. I look forward to your feedback, your corrections, and all of that. And you can look forward to part two coming very soon on the historical origins of the conflict in the Middle East. With that, good day and God bless. Mm -hmm.